to what? If oh, you'd on. like to be a woman, you can identify as a woman. I don't know why there is such an issue around... We've literally just seen a male rapist use that scam to get himself put into a female prison where he could attack vulnerable women. It, it's... it's 42% it's, it's a... of, of trans-identifying prisoners in prison are in there for sex crimes. There's actually an advantage evidently to identifying as a female because they never identify as male because somehow male prisons seem less appealing to them. It's really weird. So many benefits. Right, but if anyone, according to you, can identify as a woman, anyone can, right? Uh, that's your opinion. You can think I'm ridiculous, but I don't think you can say, well, it has to be... I don't know why I am, but you're not. You're, I, I don't think you have to say it's post-op is the only way that someone's allowed to identify well, the, as trans. The original, standard for, for us on, the original standard for being transgender was being diagnosed with gender dysphoria which is a legitimate condition. And now it's been, oh, however way you feel. So if you feel on Tuesday you're a woman and on Thursday you're a pizza, that's perfectly valid. But to you, that's ridiculous. And I, I want to know why that is ridiculous. We should be talking about actual women on International Women's Day. That's not crazy. Hey everyone, it's Brandon Tatum, and with Easter just around the corner, I'm excited to share with you an incredible opportunity to experience an unforgettable journey of hope, beauty, and music. World-renowned tenor Andrea Bocelli is bringing us the Journey of Music special, a musical extravaganza that will take us across the stunning Italian countryside. You'll be treated to breathtaking performances from Michael W. Smith, Tori Kelly, Taya and Tornwells, all set against the backdrop of Italy's awe-inspiring scenery. The Journey A Music Special is a celebration of the moments that define us, the music that move us, and the relationships that matter the most. So mark your calendar for April the 2nd, the 3rd, and the 6th, and head to a local theater near you to experience this incredible event on the big screen. You won't want to miss this. For more information and to purchase tickets, visit the journey dot movie. Trust me, this is a journey you won't forget. Happy Easter, everybody. Esther, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. I saw you on the Pierce Morgan show and I said, I have to interview this young lady because I rarely see people on Pierce Morgan show at all. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. That's logical. That's, you know, like a, a thinker, a person who's willing to say the tough things or say what we all know to be true out loud. And so I purposefully, purposely did not do much research because I want to know more about you on the spot live. So, <laughs> and this video is not live, it's recorded, but. Okay. Um, so Esther, can you tell us um, kind of what's your background? Where were you born? How were you raised? Two parent home, single parent home? Can, can mm. you just uh, walk us through that journey? Um, so I'm actually gone in. Uh, so I was raised in Ghana, um, very traditional Christian two parent home. Um, and I went to school in Ghana and then I moved to the UK. I moved to London when I was 14, um, mainly for an education. But I moved over with my brother um, and my parents kind of came back and forth. Um, and I've been living in the UK ever since. Uh, so I come from quite a fairly sort of traditional background. Um, I studied, uh, I read politics and French at the University of Bristol. And I, I've always kind of been into political activism. That was always kind of my background. Um, and then I, I sort of moved further into writing and broadcasting. But socially, in terms of kind of my values and how I grew up, I, I grew up in a fairly sort of traditional setup. Um, it wasn't so traditional that I was completely illiberal and incapable of understanding opposing viewpoints. It was just these are the sets of values that we've raised you with that we believe that will equip you best to get the best out of life. Um, in, in, in encompassing that, we also want you to be tolerant and and uh, welcoming of other people's views and lifestyles, but obviously not compromising your own values. Um, so that's kind of always been how I've moved through the world. Um, and it's probably why I've had no qualms with uh, calling out lunacy when I see it, um, <laughs> just because I've always assumed that people would give me the same uh, respect. Tolerance goes both ways, right? Yeah, a, a thousand percent. So you, you go through college, um, you were raised traditional, so you have more of what you say conservative leaning values or is that yes. something that you developed over time? Have you always been this conservative? I think so. I mean, I, I, I really struggle to kind of envision a world where this wouldn't be how I turned out. I mean, I don't understand how I would possibly have been kind of a blue haired liberal feminist. Not to say that I look down on them or anything like that. It's just it would be so outside the realm of how I grew up, even in my culture. It, we're just very traditional. Um, we have very strong sort of beliefs and values on certain things. I can't imagine a world where I wouldn't have um, been kind of oriented in this way. 
it would be quite bizarre to me. But I've always been surrounded by people that grew up differently and I've never had any issues with them. The standard used to be respect me and I'll respect you and we'll, we will have open and free debates. Um, but, you know, the animosity will leave it at the door because we're at the end of the day just trying to further humanity. And somehow that got lost in the last 10 years uh, where I was actually quite a you know normal and tolerant person because I, I respected people just for who they are. And now I'm suddenly a bigot because I'm refusing to call a single person they. And I don't know when the Overton window shifted so far to this kind of lunacy, but I'd like it to stop. <laughs> I, I agree with you 20,000 percent. I, I, th I thought it was absolutely asinine. The young lady on the mm -hmm. show, um, she could not answer simple questions because she had fallen so deep in hypocrisy. Um, you know, just like Pierce was saying that what, what can I identify as a black feminist? It, it, a black it, lesbian. It, a le <laughs> yeah, a black lesbian. That's what it was. A black lesbian. Yeah. And it just blew her mind because, um, you know, that that's that's a possibility given the fact that people believe you can identify as whatever you want to identify at any time with no proof, with no transition, with no nothing. And it blows their mind when they're caught in that conundrum. And so being out in, in, in the UK, correct? Mm, um, yes. Have you been to America? I have. Yes, I have. Yes. I have, went have to been, New York. Have you been often? Uh, not too often, but I'm fairly familiar with the U.S. Okay. Because, you know, I don't know if it's, it's much different in the U.K. than in the U.S. You know, we deal with some of these same crazy lunatic ideas. Um, I'm just wondering, have you had the exposure here in America and you feel like it's the same? Or do you think it's worse in the U.K.? Uh, well, you know the saying, when the U.S. sneezes, the U.K. catches a cold. I think that's a, a pretty accurate uh, <laughs> summation of, of kind of how trends move from the U.S. Uh, to the U.K. I think one of the things that I do, I, I suppose, I respect more about kind of American uh, public platforms and in the way that these debates are conducted is the fact that at the very least, you know, free speech does mean something in the US. And even if you don't agree with someone, if you find the, the views completely abhorrent or distasteful, or whatever, at least that person has doesn't have a fear of speaking up. That's not the same in the UK. And it's it's progressively becoming more illiberal. Um, I think one of the reasons why, I mean, that, that com one of the things that com uh, culminated in the interview that we had on Piers' show with that lady is the fact that so many people have been scared to speak out. I've often made the point that, you know, the standard for being a transgender individual would be, was to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which is a deep discomfort and disconnection with the, with the sex that you were born into. That doesn't mean that your sex suddenly changes. It's a recognition of the fact that mentally you feel a deep disconnection with your physical sex. And and so, you know, society would treat you with the same respect as we would other people, so long as you don't harm people or it doesn't clash with other people's rights. And somehow that Overton window has shifted so much that trans being transgender has become an ideology in the form of transgenderism, which is that uh, your your perceived view of yourself and your gender identity has to be recognized in public life and therefore reflected in public policy. So for instance, we must affirm the fact that you feel like the opposite sex. And that has repercussions in terms of, you know, particularly women's safety. So if you feel like a woman, that, that means you in, in the context of, of, of public space, you are allowed to be in women's spaces like women's shelters, for instance, or women's prisons, which is one of the scandals that deposed our first, the first former first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. She literally allowed a male rapist into a female prison and had a tough time when she had to explain that. And I think, you know, th these were things 10 years ago we could openly discuss in the UK and there wouldn't be really much qualms around it. But because this whole idea of, of or the ideology of transgenderism has really taken root in public life, now it, the, the personal has become political. And, you know, the separation of your personal life from, from your public life and public policy, moreover, has, has become so enmeshed. So now the idea is if you don't believe that because I've, I've effectively mutilated myself and chopped off my penis, I am now a woman. If you don't believe that, that's actually a form of violence against them. And, and it, it's really it's, it's quite weird, but it's also very detrimental, mainly to women, because I don't really see many sort of female rapists, if they do exist, God forbid, going into male men's prisons. 42 percent of all tra uh, tra trans identifying prison prisoners are there in prison for sexual offenses right i don't really see many trans men competing in men's sports because that's a complete impossibility they wouldn't even get past the first round right this is something that's uniquely affecting women and for some reason to speak up against it is now being a trans exclusionary radical feminist which is very odd because i never considered myself a feminist to begin with let alone trans exclusionary um so it, I, I at the very least in the u.s these debates are being had because free speech means something and i think in many parts of the western world that's becoming less and less the case Wow. Wow. I couldn't even imagine it being 
worse than it is in America. I mean, I, mm. it, I go to universities. Um, just I went to a, a university called Michigan Tech. And before I even got there, they did not. Some of the students protested me and they said, mm. look, we, we don't want him here. He's homophobic. He's transphobic. Some people got up and made an impact statement um, for lack of better terms. And they were alluding to the fact that I hurt their feelings and all of these things. And, and, and I'm similar to you. I, I really don't care what a person yeah. identifies. It really don't. It, I, I wouldn't even know unless you came and told me, hey, I identify as X, Y, Z. But when you start thrusting it out into the public sphere and you start to thwart other people's constitutional rights and safety, then, then we have a problem. And yeah. the biggest thing here is that people that tend to identify with that side, with the with the leftist lunacy, are people who are very non-accepting of other viewpoints. I understand that people may believe that individuals were born that way. I disagree. But I'm not going to go out and protest anybody. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I'm not going to create a term for somebody who decides to live a certain lifestyle that's contrary to what I believe is is the conducive lifestyle for success. So it's, it's a very stark difference between the two factions. So I have another question. How, how did you are, are you a regular? Because I think I've seen you more than once on Pierce Morgan's mm. show. Are, are you a regular on the show? Are you a part of the show? How, how did that transpire? Yeah, so I, I'm a talk TV contributor. So uh, Piers the shows uh, show is one of the shows that I do on talk TV. But uh, generally speaking, I'm a broadcaster and writer. So I tend to do um, the, the media circuit more broadly here in the UK. Um, I do a bit of Sky Australia. Um, I do some local channels here, Sky, um, BBC, oh, BBC, yes, LBC, um, Channel 5, kind of the, the kind of local networks. And I write as well for newspapers. Um, so I tend to write op-ed pieces for for various uh, papers, uh, and I do a few odd bits here and there. But yeah, I'm 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 a regular on Piers' show. Awesome. I mean, you should be, man. God dang, you you bring sanity to the show. <laughs> do you have a podcast? <laughs> do you, do you do your own podcast or anything like that? Not yet. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the details around that. I know I've been uh, I've been asked many times, uh, and obviously I'm sort of working on on a book and all of that. Um, but it, it is fascinating because I do have friends in this space that are actually academics and um, you know writers. Uh, they're not really kind of uh, just people that uh, you would think would be spouting absurdities because their their level of education is quite advanced, and uh, they they often you know get apprehensive about saying certain things or speaking certain realities um just because this 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 rotten ideology of really kind of shouting down other people you don't agree with and this postmodernist idea that the person has become so political that you you have to shun people from from public debates is really deep rooted now in society and it's not just the universities which is really quite chronic i mean the platforming in universities now has become commonplace i'm so embarrassed to say that the university i went to has, has started deplatforming people as well in the last few years um but it's, it's all all across public life would you believe that our national health service has, is, has been removing the word woman from from pages that refer to pregnant women for instance or things to do with breastfeeding or women's health menopause all of that they're calling us chest feeders um they're just referring to people that menstruate i mean really just degrading stuff and this is our national health service it, it really goes so far i mean in the trial for isla bryson who was the scottish male uh, rapist that was put in a female's prison the prosecution had to refer well no, yeah the prosecution had to refer to uh, isla bryson with her penis he used she used her penis to penetrate the victims and and the the the, the rapist victims were sitting there in court having to watch this it was completely dehumanizing but these are the kind of things that are, are happening and it's it's just it's just ridiculous and it's horrible yeah, I, I could I could only imagine living through that. I feel bad for women because well, men men have their own set of challenges, but I feel like that it's it's white males in America are challenged to no end. Females of all race in America are are, are challenged to no end. When you have males out here just murdering women, I, I mean not not literally but figuratively in sports. I mean they're dominating. They're dominating track and field. They're dominating swimming. I mean, they're dominating. They're getting awards for women of the year. I mean, it is the craziest stuff I've ever seen. And I feel bad for women because women in our country have fought so hard for so long in order to have equality and rights and, and have a fair opportunity to succeed in America, living the American dream like anybody else. And now, to be honest, it's being thwarted to a, a particular mm. degree, because if a man says, you know what, I, I'm, I want to be a woman today, they are championed. In America, in many facets, the Dylan Mulvaney, which is the the guy that 
turned mm. himself into a girl and now he's a celebrity, had had an opportunity to interview the president of the United States and had only been a, a girl for, I don't know, 100 days or something like that. Then had a whole special for being a girl for 365 days. I mean, yeah. just mocking women by wearing, you know, walking around with tampons and as if he can use the tampons anywhere. I, it's just it's it's lunacy to me. Now, do you do you have the same experience? And because most of what you spoke about on the show and one of the reasons why I want to talk to you was the lunacy about the transgenderism and ideologies. Mm. Um, do you have the same experience with victimhood? Do you want to you are you familiar with CRT? In America, yes, 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 yes. Critical race theory. Do you see? The, do you see the same uh, happening with the transgender confusion as it is with victimhood of being black? Like, are you challenged like oh. we are in America, meaning that since you're black and you have a certain ideology, that you're somehow a traitor to your race? Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, me and some of the people that I work with, we've been, been cam campaigning to to remove the word BAME, which is an acronym that sounds for black and. Um, Black and Asian um, and ethnic minority. It's basically a, a term that's a catch-all for non-white people in the UK. And it's been used uh, as a kind of a, a, a catch-all word to en en encompass a, a group of people that really have very different priorities and different cultures and stuff like that, but it's just non-white. So in the UK, you're you're automatically a political group and it's, it's become redundant. Um, but we have so many instances of, of kind of this transposition of, of American politics and America's, American social politics into British life. So for instance, the BLM riots that uh, started in the US and, and happened in the UK, there were there was a, there were infamous scenes of, of these people shouting at our police, you know, don't shoot, hands up. Um, and it was completely absurd because I don't know if you know, the British police don't routinely walk around with firearms. Firearms are illegal in the UK. Even our police are not regularly armed. They're only special divisions that have that. So you can imagine you have some 18 year old moronic know nothing students shouting don't shoot at London Metropolitan Police that are carrying batons and that was the, the absurdity and the lunacy that 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 encompassed this country but there are also so many uh, kind of uh, social instances where you, you know you're encouraged to shout your oppression and I, and I, I find that really antithetical to what we used to pride ourselves on which was a kind of an anglo-american uh, exceptionalism right you were you 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 got you got what you received based on your hard work and not based on the color of your skin and we really had this kind of enterprising entrepreneurial culture it was based on a meritocracy and now it's oh i earn less than you therefore you're so privileged oh i i am brown um, and therefore i'm less privileged than you who is white even though that person i mean I, I literally had a friend i kid you not he was homeless for about a decade he was also a heroin addict and the reason why he was homeless was because he was a white male and getting on the social housing ladder in the UK was more complicated because he wasn't a female um, and he was a he was a drug addict and he got himself clean started working out ended up joining the the, the navy here in the UK um wow. started a family has a home now and he decided to give back and he started working for for a homeless shelter I kid you not the first day he got into the homeless shelter working with other homeless people there was a person that came to give a speech about their white privilege even though every single person in that room was homeless um and he was like even even at our low we are still being bombarded with this idea of our white privilege. Um, so it's very much, you know, the transposition of a lot of these issues that you'd see in America, but in other countries as well, in, in the UK, in Canada, in Australia. I suppose it's less prevalent in countries like France and Germany, which are still Western countries. But I think the 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 platform for public discourse is far, far blunter, I would say this. Uh, I think uh, U Europeans mainly have a reputation for being no-nonsense individuals. There is no such thing as, you know, censoring people. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very blunt. Um, I lived in France for, for a bit and I, I can attest to that. Um, so the, I think the landscape for debate is a bit different there. But, you know, we do, here in the UK in particular, a lot of the social issues that you find in the US um, are quite are mirrored here uh, quite considerably, at least 18 months on. Yeah, I, I was I often wonder that because, you know, when you come here, especially you, you were you were born in Ghana, correct? I didn't yeah. make sure you were born in Ghana. So you you, you go to the you, you move to the UK and you have these experiences, this education. You have a, a wonderful family that raised you right. And if you were to move to America, you would have the similar experience, right? You would have a great education. Your parents would raise you right. You would come out to be an intelligent person, probably with a different accent, but you would be <laughs> the same person. However, in America, and I don't know, this could be the same in UK. In America, there's the black 
Americans or the Americans mm. of African descent, never born in Africa, never w- were raised in Africa, didn't come from nowhere near Africa. And they have this sense of oppression that supersedes people who were slaves in this country way back mm. when. And what they normally do is a good person like you will come with a great family structure and they will tell you, you don't know you're oppressed. You don't you don't realize that there's racism mm. everywhere. You don't realize that you don't have the, the same rights as white people in this country. I mean, I, I, I've seen it with my own eyes. People that come here from Africa, that were born in Africa, they come to the United States. They are they are brainwashed into believing in this racist stuff that do not even exist really in America. There are a few people who are racist. I mean, I say a few people. There's probably groups that are racist, but systemic racism, uh, systematic racism do not exist in the United States of America as as far as what my experiences are in law enforcement and also in just public life. So do you have that same sentiment where you have blacks who may not have never lived in Africa who come with this influence of, of, of trying to convince you that just because you're black, that somehow you're at a disadvantage? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have it initially when I first moved here, because like I said, I think that the way the discourse has changed has been very rapid, certainly in the last decade or so. So when I was in secondary school here, I, did, I certainly didn't experience that. But then when I went to university, um, which is unfortunately a hotbed for all of these kind of lunacies, um, I had someone saying, oh, don't you get offended when people ask you where you're from? And I just thought, do I look Scottish to anyone? Who, who the hell looks at me and thinks my ancestors hail from the Scottish Highlands? Of course, my ancestors come from a clearly hot place. I'm black. And I found it so absurd that she thought I'd be offended by that. Um, and she was like, oh, it's probably because you're African and you're not really offended by things. I was like, no, it's because I would, it would be patently absurd for me to be offended by that. I come from a country where, you know, I'm still thinking of how to send some money back home to some of uh, my friends to try and, you know, get their kids in a better school or, you know, try and get, help them with their business, all of that. People have real problems back home. And you expect me, who I'm so grateful every single day that I had the opportunity to go to school in the UK and to, to be educated and all of that. I'm so grateful for that. You expect me to sit there like a, you know, wallowing in some sort of imaginary victimhood when I certainly didn't experience what my ancestors ancestors did but certainly you didn't either I mean I remember I wrote a piece for the Daily Mail um, and it was with regards to this lady um, from the Trevelyan family she works for the BBC which is our national broadcaster again we shouldn't have a national broadcaster but there you have it um, that we have to pay for but anyway she was uh, her family had paid reparations to um, the island of Granada because her her ancestors owned slaves and I remember I wrote a piece in the Daily Mail um, you know obviously criticizing that but one of the parallels I drew was I have family that actually live in San Francisco and they're pretty well off they work in Silicon Valley they're pretty high ups in the uh, in the companies that they work for and they're actually our tribe in Ghana um they're, they're Fantis like ours and the Fanti tribe actually well the Akan tribe more generally uh well the Akans uh they actually benefited the ancestral leaders benefited from from the slave trade because they aligned with the British and you know the the, the, the whole I suppose economy of slavery was very com- complex and nuanced but under the proposals of from the San Francisco um, you know, governor, governorship, I should say, or the politicians, they would have received reparations for something that their ancestors benefited from, right? So you have a situation where black people whose ancestors actually benefited from the slave trade would have received reparations from the San Francisco, uh, poli- from San Francisco politicians um, based on this arbitrary notion that somehow you should receive reparations for something that you never experienced and that your life is much better at. I, I, often, I often ask Americans, particularly black Americans that are kind of en- en- ensconced in this uh, victimhood narrative, which I'm not completely unsympathetic to. I do understand that they're social issues, but I say, why don't you trade your passport for a Ugandan passport. You wouldn't. None of these people ever come to the front of the queue and say, actually, we want to trade our passports for an, an African one, right? Or we generally think we're, we'd be better off if we stayed in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, and live the way most Africans do. But somehow they believe that they're entitled to, to this, to this, you know, sum of, of reparations money, which they're never going to get. That, that Let's just call a spade a spade. They're never going to get it. The intricacies and the nuances are too complicated, and it's patently absurd. Um, and I just, I don't understand why there's such a lack of gratitude which i find quite shocking i think it takes a certain amount of humility to say actually i i have it pretty good i'm i'm in amongst the, the generation that are the most well off in human history and i should there should be some sort of level of gratitude coming from me as opposed to me trying to make people that were never responsible for any hardships of my my ancestors pay for something that i have never experienced and i find that very bizarre yeah it's very it's very bizarre to me as well you know i i, I don't understand well i do understand when i grew up um I grew up with that sentiment of being a victim, the white man bad, you know, because that's what I was taught socially, peer 
um, I guess, exposure. Also, the media, hip hop music at the time that I, the, the music that I listened to painted the picture that I was some oppressed person and that the white man was always looming over the top of me, waiting for the opportunity to, to, to pounce and, and thwart me from, from growing and being successful in America. And then I grew up and grew out of it. I started to look in the mirror and start to look around and say, well, that's not what I thought it was. I had exposure because I grew up in an all black community. So I it was yeah. hardly ever had real interactions with white people, um, real significant interactions with white people outside of maybe a, a person here, a teacher here or whatever the case may be. But then when I went to college, I went to the University of Arizona and I played I played football there. But when I went there, it was nothing but white people. And I, and I had got exposed to the fact that I haven't had a person say a racist thing to me. I haven't had a teacher that, that that didn't do nothing but treat me with respect. I don't feel it any different than anybody else here on campus. Matter of fact, they treated us like kings because we were athletes. And so I started to really wake up. I became a police officer in uh, 2011 um, after I was in the NFL draft and all of that. But I was I, I was uh, I became a police officer. And I started to really realize, well, I don't see a lot of racist cops out here. I don't see a lot of bad behavior by police officers for the most part. It was a few bad apples that I, I could not stand when I was a cop. But I started to realize that I don't really think policing the way we perceived it to be was reality. Because yeah. when I went on patrol, we had to take calls for service and save people's lives. And we didn't have a chance to say, is this person black? Is this person gay? Is this person Christian? Is it Muslim? We, we, it was never even a thought. I mean, you're going mm -hmm. lights and sirens, um, going as fast as you can to save people's lives. And it never occurred to me about race and anybody else that I work with. Um, okay. But I can understand how people were, how they may feel that way. But I do understand that there's a better way. So I guess what I want to propose to you is that what do you think the solution to these things are? Is there a solution? Are, are we on a downhill trajectory, kind of like the Titanic, meaning that it's going down? Well, we got to <laughs> save as many people as we can, but it's going down. It's, there's no saving it at this point. Um, what are your thoughts on solutions and can this be resolved? Um, I, I think one of the things that I, I, I do think is very helpful is actually um, looking at the facts of situations. So I, obviously I'm not, uh, I, I didn't grow up in the US, but I, I did a fair bit of, of research on policing in the US and kind of the different funding that police, um, various uh, police districts get and kind of how that leads to inconsistencies in training and all of that. And I thought, you know, that's from 10 minutes of, of me researching. If you're so passionate about these issues, why, why don't you actually do some research with an open mind? Why don't you actually sit down with someone that will probably be more knowledgeable in certain issues and have conversations? I feel like most people get their information from, from, from sound bites on Instagram and, and Twitter and, and YouTube. And I just feel like that's not enough. I'm, I'm really not used to a culture where people that are seeking out information or at least interested in an idea don't you know, look to people that are more educated or try and educate themselves more and um, try and be open because nothing's ever black and white. So tr trying to have a more nuanced and balanced perspective, even though you can have your views and your, your values um, all the same. Um, so I think definitely trying to push uh, actual just people doing independent research and elevating voices that may not necessarily be popular, but just to give people as much of a broad and balanced view as possible. And always the cream rises to the top. You can tell the empty talking heads eventually if you listen to them long enough, you can you can separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, but I also think just defending free speech. I think that's probably the, the, the most important thing. Um, never tiring from call, of, of calling things out. I often say that we are sacrificing brilliant minds at the altar of of a lot of rubbish. Uh, you know, like kind of, kind of going back and forth on what a woman is when someone has you know a PhD in, in chemistry and they're sitting on TV arguing a woman is this or a man is this. I just what a waste of a brain. But we have to do that. We have to keep reiterating facts because if we don't, if we keep ceding ground to people that are more concerned with an agenda than rather just being factually accurate that's how we keep losing um so i think those are probably two of the, the two main ways i try and encourage people to do some independent research um, with an open mind and then defending free speech absolutely to to, to the end of time and and i and i agree with you a thousand percent i think that was a very articulate way to say um how things could improve and what we should mm -hmm. do to keep up the fight and but do you think that it's like this this crazy notion where you have to defend what a woman is. Do you think that these things are going to get better with our 
um, enthusiasm and, and opening up people's eyes, you know, encouraging people to do research, challenging uh, people on these points. Do you think that it's going to change anything or, or do you think that we're going to go downhill? We're going to never well, stop. But people like you and I are going to keep kind of trying to save as many people as we can. I think one of the things that I do think is important, and this is probably just goes back to my values, is personal responsibility. So I think living your life as an example to people that are looking for an alternative is a really powerful thing. So I often say I don't, I don't get too concerned about, you know, a very, very kind of left wing individuals because one, they tend to be less attractive. They tend to have fewer kids. I don't think they're going to propagate to the future generations uh, and really kind of put up a good fight. I, I, don't, I, I seriously, I don't, I don't believe they're going to be a, a really significant threat in the future. Um, so, you know, I, I but I, I believe that for someone like me with my values, I do have a responsibility to get married, have children, raise them in a particular way, try and be a positive influence, not always be kind of sensationalist and incendiary, but stand by my values and always speak the truth. I think that's long term. That's a, that's a, a more viable strategy. Um, I also think with, with regards to free speech and constantly reiterating certain facts, I think at some point we would have to draw a line in the sand. I genuinely believe that at some point in the next few years, we will have to say, we don't really care what you identify as. However, in the public space, these are the rules that we play by. In the public space, we we re recognize you by your chromosomes. I don't even want to go into the sex and gender and gender identity debate. It's down to your chromosomes because that is something that you can never change. No amount of gender reassignment surgery or self mutilation or, or what, having a you know testicles hanging out of your dress is going to prove the fact that you are of the opposite sex. So we just stick it down to the basics, draw a line in the sand, and let the hooligans do what they want to do. And just you know the rest of us that are more common sense oriented, try and live exemplary lives. That doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but we have to live our lives and emulate the sort of the sort of values that we espouse um which i think is very important you know be be the change that you want to see oh i love that i love that i appreciate that uh, <laughs> thank you so much esther for saying these things i mean you i knew this was going to be an incredible interview i knew you were going to say a lot of things that, that make me think i mean just the way you you speak about the things that we can do to improve and and how to do you know I guess be an individual and be an example is incredibly powerful. It's, it's more powerful than wasting time thinking about how do I fix all of this? It's really yeah. just, hey, how do I fix the person in the mirror? And if I live as an example of success and happiness and joy and logic and reason and, and being, you know, in the Bible, it talks about treating people the way you want to be treated. You know, one of the yeah. concepts of, you know, if, if you, you know, if you want to judge harshly, then you'll be judged harshly. So, yeah treating people with the compassion that you want to be treat, treated with. You know, I had a person at one of my events get up and yell at me. And yeah, of course I got him a little bit, you know, I had to, you know, the, it was one of the blue haired liberals get up and scream <laughs> at me about racism in America. And it, it, she, I don't even know if it was a boy or girl, but the person happened to be, uh, and I, I really don't know. I like, I looked at yeah. him and I was like, I think it's a boy, but then I'm like, is that a girl <laughs> trying to be a boy? It was like a really weird, this person was probably non-binary or something. So they get up and yell at me about uh, racism in this country. And, mm. and I mean, in the middle of my speech. So I just walk over and give it a mic and I say, look, you know, what privileges do you have that I don't have? Go. Well, uh, 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 I said, well, yeah. you don't. Unless you're, unless you're prepared to be a racist right now and say that you're better than me because of the color of your mm. skin versus mine. So it was, it was very a very interesting dialogue, but it's, it's more conducive to look in the mirror and say, yeah. okay, how can I improve as a person? How can I treat my family better? How can I build my environment? And it's more powerful. You, you, you actually, I don't think you understand your, your agency and your personal autonomy is a more powerful force for change than trying to fix the world. It's like what, you know, people, Jordan Peterson says, you know, you know, tidy your room or something like that. That's actually more powerful because you're in a better place to try and positively impact the world. You may not necessarily go and stand in the UN and give a speech, but if you're getting your life together, that has a ripple effect on the people around you. I have a friend that I grew up with in Ghana. We went to the same school. And it, I don't know if you know much about the sort of Ghanaian education system, but they split classes based on ability. So they have A, B, C. And so A is like kind of the best students, B, and then all of that. And I, at the time, I think I was like six or seven, I was in A. And she had moved up from B to A and she was sat next to me. And she was like, Esther, that year that I sat next to you, uh, my position, so basically they rank students basically based on your, your averages. So they rank you first, which is the best in the class, second, third, all of that. And she was like, I went from like 20 something to like fifth 
in the class, just being sat next to you for a year, because I watched you and you were so determined and you were always so kind of astute and you were a bit cocky. You just make jokes in class because you, you, you but, but you know, you, you were always kind of very disciplined. I was very much like my father um, in that way. But really, when you start improving on yourself, the, the ripple effect you have on the people in your life is, is spectacular. People see that, oh, you've gotten fitter, you're, you're better in shape. They ask you, how did you do it? Let's do it together. We're friends. And then they meet someone and they say, actually, you know, I've cut down on, on the fried stuff or all of that. And so you, you, you're, you're automatically generating a healthier social circle in the same way. You know, if you choose to kind of ignore nonsense and try and focus and get your mindset right, you have a positive impact because people realize, how are you so at peace? Or you're at peace most of the time. Can you just give me some tips? It really does have a ripple effect i believe that people are more powerful as autonomous agents than trying to you know hark on and that's exactly what people on the very far left do they don't have their lives in order they have short blue hair they they're the ones kind of overweight and objectively unattractive but they're trying to convince everyone they are attractive and that they have their lives together it's like the hypocrisy of hollywood you know people in hollywood actors and actresses in hollywood would stand up there and give the public a speech on things they objectively know nothing about because most of them didn't even finish secondary school and yet you look at their personal lives they a lot of them struggle with alcoholism drug use most of them are divorced with four or five kids you know everyone in hollywood sleeps with the same 20 people i mean <laughs> objectively they're not a social model to emulate and so i think we just need to reorient our thinking in that way no i, I love that um when i was in my graduate school um we learned uh, the external locus of control compared to yeah. the internal locus of control and that was just such an incredible class because i took uh uh, the study was uh, business leadership. And so mm -hmm. we were talking about those, you know, how to deal with employees and how to, how should you focus as a, as an employer, as a leader is having an internal locus of control, meaning that everything that happened come from within me. And I, I love that you said that. And I feel like I need to talk about this more. Maybe I'll talk mm -hmm. about it on my radio show. It's the power of you being the person that you uh, ought to be the best version of yourself because it's so much more effective. I think actions speak louder than words every time. You hear Absolutely. a person doing a lot of talking, but you don't see them doing a lot of stuff. The talk can make you feel good for a short period of time, but then overall, there's no substance. But a person who's doing it, you look and you say, you know what? I really like what that person is doing. And I really like the way that person is treating other people. I really like that person's happiness and joy. And I want to try to effectively use some of those tools in my own personal life so I can become better. Jordan Peterson uh, had this saying, and I went to one of his speeches and it was like three hours long. And I'm the type of person that can listen to somebody talk for three hours and I won't, mm -hmm. I won't even break eye contact. Um, but it was, it was very, very long. But one of the things that he had made mention was that, people should focus on like instead of you trying to go out and be an activist to change the world how about you do those things in your own household how about yeah. you build a relationship with your mother and 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 help that relationship and and if you want to change somebody put somebody's political mind how about you talk you know build with your own family start there yeah. cuz if you could change the lives of people who are around you that that's within arms reach of you then you can definitely be a force for the world. So it's, I, it's like a, it's like a beam, isn't it? I genuinely believe it's, it's it's you radiate that sort of positivity. I mean, sometimes I have all my friends are female, and they they you know women during that time of the month they start, start whinging all the time and complaining. Oh, I'm so fat. <laughs> Um, and then my friend would be like, oh, Esther, I'm so fat. I'm like, no, you're not. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, look around me. I don't have any fat friends. And she was like, okay. And she's like, yes, all my friends are to a certain extent. That's not to say that I could never be a friend of the fat person. Right, but right. You, you are part of a group of people that I surround myself with. You're all intelligent. You're all very like, feminine, ladylike. You don't so necessarily, you're not crass. You're all healthy and fit. You all dress well, you communicate nicely, you're polite and all of that. And that made her feel better. And it wasn't trying to say you're part of an elite club. But it says, look, these are the standards I'm trying to hold myself to in my personal life. And that is to say that you, I, I, I love how you live your life and how, and I, and I believe that we share the values that allow me to be close to you and to keep you at proximity. And for, when I told her that she started thinking, gosh, I actually, you, you, you know, birds of a feather flock together. When you even start to upgrade yourself in certain aspects of your life, you start to gravitate towards people on that same journey. And, you know, there is a ripple effect. I genuinely believe that. I'm, I'm hugely into sort of looking to yourself and what you can do and how you can make incremental changes in your life as opposed to trying to put the world to rights all the time. Perfect. Esther, thank you so much uh, for all the wonderful words. I, I like to keep it short. I have to, we have to do another interview because I, I can only <laughs> imagine that you have a lot to say 
about marriage and oh yeah absolutely women <laughs> I, I could I could feel it coming out the TV screen. Yes, yes, that, yes, because, yeah. Uh, someone people... called me the female Andrew Tate, which is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is hilarious. I'm, I'm very I'm very blunt. Uh, I I am uh, which is interesting because my parents are far more blunt than I am. I mean, if you sit in the room with African uncles, oh really? my god. I've, we're not used to centering ourselves. So I, I find it very weird, this kind of new dichotomy where I have to kind of be a bit more, but yeah, we're not, it's, it's not a culture I'm familiar with at all. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of views on that. Yeah, we, I have to, I have to bring you back. And, and even we have a, uh, uh, I'll talk about it offline, but we have a, a weekly show and, and it's like a panel with a few of us. And it's, it's invaluable to have people talk about relationships and, and women mm -hmm. and, and holding themselves accountable. Also men as well. But you yeah. know, now people have fallen off the wagon. I mean, it's, it's a show called the whatever show they got fresh and fit. They got Pearl, um, this young lady. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a quite an interesting, uh, yeah. minefield. I think, uh, you know, the, 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 let me just put it this way the 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 space for the common sense um conservative or if i was yeah conservative or whatever shrinking and that's quite depressing um because yeah. the more incendiary and sensationalist that you get the more kind of the optimal lifestyle looks actually undesirable by the public because they just think i have to do things the way they do it and i i just think that's not how we should be going right i agree okay esther um where can people find you on social media how can they buy your book did you already write a book and you're writing your second one i'm writing it now I'm, I'm actually writing it now <laughs> i'm writing it i'm i'm kind of going back and forth with my agent because he's like where is it and i was like calm down yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so you can find me on uh twitter it's esther, esther k underscore k um, if you just type in SDK, you'll probably find me because I'm the only one on, on, on Twitter. Um, but I feature regularly on Talk TV, uh, so mainly Piers' show and other shows on the channel. I also do Sky News Australia. I write for various newspapers here in the UK. Uh, and I do bits and bobs. So if you're in the UK, you've probably seen something of mine floating around. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. God bless you. And I, I look forward to having another interview with you, if it's okay with you, because I, I just think you're you so brilliant. Yeah, so you know, you remind me of two people that I absolutely adore. One is Candace Owens, and then her husband. <laughs> well, let me say why. Because <laughs> her husband's from the UK, so your accent yeah. is almost the same as his, and your brilliance is is liking to what I see in Candace Owens, being bold, being courageous, all of those things. And it's kind of funny, like I'm it's, it's almost like I'm listening to Candace talk with with her husband's voice. So anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, I put out three videos a day. So make sure you go to the uh, playlist that says new video and watch more videos. Subscribe to this channel. Let's go, baby.